Uh, we've got a great speaker coming up, and I couldn't think of anyone better uh, to introduce him than Lucy Culp on our team, uh, who you've already met. <clears throat> uh, Lucy, as I mentioned, leads our state government affairs work uh, at LLS, and she also uh, has another interesting role. She is a consumer representative to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, uh, and she and our next, next speaker, excuse me, she and our next speaker can tell you a little bit more about what that group of people is. Uh, but I'd like to hand it over to Lucy Culp uh, to introduce our next guest. Thanks, Ryan. Um, it is my, you know, absolutely my pleasure to introduce you to Delaware Insurance Commissioner Trinidad Navarro. Um, Co Commissioner Navarro was first selected to his role back in 2016 and leads the office in protecting, educating, and advocating for Delaware residents by, you know, really by ensuring that insurance is affordable and available and, and holding insurance companies accountable. Um, as a lifelong Delawarean, uh, Commissioner Navarro has a really extensive record of public service including 20 years with the Newcastle County Police and being elected Newca Newcastle County Sheriff in 2010. Um, while a police officer, he even received the department's Distinguished Medal of Valor. Um, Commissioner Navarro, thank you so much for joining us today. I will turn it over to you from here. Well, thank you, Lucy. Uh, how's my audio? Can you hear me okay? Great, yes. Perfect. Okay, uh, well, um, thank you for having me. Uh, Ryan and I had a conversation about what we might talk about today. And I'll just tell you that I wish I was on the panel earlier where we talked about uh, the junk plans, um, the short-term duration plans, the uh, health sharing ministries. I mean, they're, that's something that's right up my alley. Uh, it's something that as the, uh, the chair of the um, Anti-Fraud Task Force with the NAIC, it's something that we deal with pretty regularly uh, with the with respect to the improper marketing of health plans. Um, we have one of your speakers had mentioned speaking to individuals who, are, who have come out of that um, profession uh, who maybe uh, were unhappy with what they were actually doing. And that's kind of how we found out what was happening in Pennsylvania. Uh, we we uh, obtained a script uh, from an individual who was calling people, cold calling, uh, marketing uh, plans and, and saying things like, uh, we're offering you an alternative to the ACA. Uh, it, it covers some essential health benefits, doesn't cover all. Uh, and they're really good and they're really persuasive. But at, at the end of the day, it turns out that they're just selling plans that are worthless. Uh, people are purchasing them because it's affordable. Uh, but when you're buying something that doesn't cover anything, you're really just wasting your money. So. We're working really hard on putting an end to, to those. And not maybe at the end, I'll be happy to take questions about that. So people, people often ask me, they understand law enforcement then being the elected sheriff, but the transition from that to insurance commissioner, they're like, they don't, they don't necessarily understand that, that, that transition. And the truth is I was an insurance agent and I was licensed uh, health insurance agent moons ago. Um, but it uh, doesn't necessarily make you qualified to be the commissioner, the fact that you were licensed, but it, it gets me speaking the language. And uh, I see what I do now uh, as very similar to what I did in law enforcement. You know, we, in law enforcement, it was Title 21, which was the, the traffic code, and Title 11, which is the criminal code, which I had to know. In the Department of Insurance, I have to know Title 18, uh, and that's the insurance code. And I essentially police the industry. Um, you'll see, and we can talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been able to do over the last uh, well, almost five years now, uh, a little over five years uh, within the department. Um, you know, what, what we do is we essentially hold insurance companies accountable for fulfilling their obligations. And some of the questions that uh, Ryan and I discussed were some of the success stories that I have had as a regulator. And um, I'll just share two of them with you really quickly. Um, there was a, a, a consumer, her name was Brenda. Uh, she was suffering from stage four renal cancer and her insurance company uh, was denying her prescription drugs. Uh, so her physician uh, prescribed Nulasta, which is a patch you wear on your arm and it's, it takes the likelihood of suffering from uh, an infection due to um, chemotherapy or radiation and lowers that um, likelihood by about 95%. Insurance company uh, denied it. Um, 
maybe even a computer program, but not uh, obviously not a physician. So uh, Brenda uh, reached out to the company. Uh, the company um, sort of gave her the runaround. Um, ultimately, she reached out to uh, one of our state representatives. She called me. I was actually in Lake Hall at the time. And uh, once I found out about it, I made one phone call. And within an hour, uh, the insurance company was covering her prescription drugs. Now, this drug is not necessarily going to save her life, but it was going to make her quality of life much more manageable. And these are the types of things that, uh, that I do as a regulator. Um, just one other quick uh, consumer success story. We had a, a, a person named Rich, who a uh, young man in his early 50s uh, was suffering from colon cancer. And uh, he had undergone treatment and he thought that uh, uh, he had survived and uh, was, was doing really well. Uh, about a year later, it came back and uh, his doctor prescribed uh, proton therapy. And um, this was not, you know, years ago when it was new or an experimental treatment, this was just recently. Um, so the insurance company denied it. And uh, the family reached out to my office. I called the family back personally and I just listened to their story. And, um, you know, it was painful to listen to because the guy's my age and um, he's looking at an uncertain future. So after I spoke to the family, um, I called the insurance company. And again, was, wasn't necessarily within an hour, but within a few hours, um, the insurance company changed their mind and, and covered the proton therapy for, for the family. And, you know, they called me back and they were, they were um, you know, obviously uh, very happy and appreciative and they were um, emotional. And, you know, when I heard the story, I got a little bit emotional too. My mom's a cancer survivor. Um, you know, I, you can't treat people, and this unfortunately is what insurance companies do, like numbers. And you treat people like you would want to treat your own family. And so that, that's why we've been really so successful with helping people within um, our community. Some of the great things that we've been able to do here in Delaware with respect to health insurance. Uh, about three years ago, before the pandemic, we worked with our um, Department of uh, Health and Social Services um, for putting together a 1332 waiver, a reinsurance waiver for, uh, for the marketplace. And you know, this was right around the time um, the former uh, president was trying to, what I call, kill the uh, ACA by a thousand paper cuts. And um, we stood firm here in Delaware. We we're actually able to codify a lot of the protections of the ACA in Delaware law, like um, you have to cover pre-existing conditions, things like that. Um, so we were able to pass this 1332 waiver, uh, which ultimately led to a 20% decrease uh, on the ACA or the, for premiums in this silver plan. And uh, I'll just say that if the previous administration had a plan where they could lower premiums by 20%, uh, I think everyone would have signed up. And um, we were really fortunate to be able to, to, to get that done. And uh, for, for many folks now in Delaware, it's about 80% of people who are on the exchange are, are eligible for tax credits. So I'm, I'm really proud of what we were able to do with lowering the premiums and protecting the ACA. Um, a couple of uh, interesting investigations that we recently completed is uh, the, our, our parity laws here in Delaware. We, we knew that there would be a, a problem with our insurers who were reimbursing or paying for treatment or prescription drugs for an illness um, or an injury, but they didn't treat uh, mental health and substance abuse treatment uh, on the same level. Um, so we did a uh, investigation into our lower, uh, four largest in insurers in Delaware, and uh, we found thousands of violations. Uh, so whether it was uh, prescriptions that were denied or treatment that was denied or um, in-person treatment that was either cut short or completely just denied. Uh, we, um, after finding those multiple uh, violations, we levied about $1.3 million in fines on these four insurers. Um, we're now about to go back in uh, to make sure that they are fulfilling their obligations like instructed because it's not just a fine and there's other penalties associated with it, but there's also the plan to correct uh, the challenges or the violations, if you will. 
And uh, so we're about to go back in now and, and do another, it's called a market conduct examination. What's really exciting today in Delaware is, um, well, I'll just back up. When I first started in 2017, we had two insurers on the exchange, uh, Highmark and Aetna. And uh, during that time period, uh, the companies were losing, you know, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars because of the adverse selection, because people were, were signing up for uh, health insurance, having a procedure, and then just dropping the insurance, not paying the premiums. Um, and uh, things like risk corridor payments, which uh, one of our senators uh, claimed that to be, or described that as a, as a bailout, a government bailout, which, one, which was originally just part of the original architecture of the ACA. So that was taken away. Um, so unfortunately, Aetna left the marketplace. They can no longer afford to stay in. Uh, so we've only had one insurer on the marketplace in Delaware for the last uh, four years. Proud to announce that we have two letters of intent, uh, which will lead us to three insurers on the exchange, uh, which really benefits consumers. You know, it does, um, uh, whenever there's competition, it, it does lower premiums. So we're really excited about that. Um, you know, we don't, I can't say for certain which companies they are just yet, because they are, they've taken all the steps. Uh, they, the, we have the letter of intent. Uh, they're going to have to work with the feds to, to have this uh, qualified health plan, but we're really excited about that. Um, two other things that uh, I wanted to mention as far as our, our legislative agenda, um, We've just uh, passed a bill with our, our General Assembly that will um, reimburse primary care doctors up to 12% more than what they're receiving today. So what, th what that does and what we're trying to do is preserve primary care physicians um, because many of them here in Delaware are going to um, uh, concierge service. Uh, they are um, uh, working for the hospitals, uh, so they're, they're going out of business and it's really leaving consumers with very few options. So this plan will actually, um, it'll make uh, the hospitals in Delaware take a little bit of a haircut uh, so we can offset the cost for the reimbursement for our primary care docs. Because we want to keep, um, you know, that's the first line of defense and that's the best one because uh, people see their primary care doc, have preventative uh, you know, treatment or, or tests and you discover an illness uh, before it gets to the point where a person has to go to the hospital. And that's, that's really is the goal. So the other thing that I want to mention real briefly is our PBM legislation that we just passed, the pharmacy benefit managers, which is the little known intermediary between the drug, drug manufacturers and the pharmacists. And uh, what we're looking at now is uh, the rebates, clawbacks, discounts that are you know, go between the manufacturer and really stay with the pharmacy benefit managers. And what, what that does is, to, well, I'll just, it is what it is. It's a billion dollar industry that's not regulated. So here in Delaware and across other states, we're working on this PBM legislation to find out where the money going and then um, <clears throat> lower premiums through um, stopping some of these practices that we fear are unfairly discriminatory. So I think that's about uh, 15 minutes that um, I had the ability to, to talk about what we're doing here in Delaware. And Ryan, I think that we were going to, or, or at least you were going to have some um, back and forth, some questions and answers. And if, I could go on and put you all to sleep for hours about insurance, but I'd be happy to, to take any questions or uh, however you want this uh, format to proceed. Sure, sure. Uh, well, keep keep the questions coming in the chat. I've uh, I've got a few people already who I know are are interested in asking questions. Um, you know, I I guess I like to start off by asking you a little a little bit about um, you know what's been your experience uh, in your role uh, in working with journalists. You know, how how have you been able to help journalists who are trying to get to the bottom of some of these questions about insurance? I, I'm not sure if you caught it, but the previous speaker. Um, specifically mentioned the Department of Insurance as a, as a good resource for uh, for journalists to tap. So, um, you know, t tell me a little bit of, a little bit about those interactions you've had. Well, I'll tell you, we've had a lot of success with um, marketing the department, and because unfortunately, people think that the Delaware Department of Insurance sells insurance, and we don't we don't do that. We regulate the industry, and when you have people who are denied um, 
you know, they may be involved in an auto accident and the insurance company says, well, we think you're 50% at fault. So we're only going to reimburse you at 50% of the cost of your vehicle. We can't do that. And people oftentimes will just take it. They think, well, the insurance company says that's the case. So, you know, that's woe is me. I'm only going to get about half of what the vehicle's worth if it was totaled. Um, so uh, what the media can do for us is help us promote what we do. Um, this is a, a big deal with respect to the ACA, with respect to having uh, three options now, three insurers on the exchange. We've never had that since the onset of the ACA. Uh, at our best time, it was just two. And really, this, this does uh, uh, you know, help consumers. But when we talk about uh, the parity investigation I mentioned earlier and the significant fines that we levied against these insurance companies, um, you know, we didn't see the type of coverage that I would have liked. Uh, and I understand that uh, bad things are happening in the world. And um, you know, when I was a police officer, I was the media coordinator. So I was the public information officer who spoke to the press every day. And every day they wanted to know what was going on. Uh, and then when we had a, a press conference, we might have seven, eight, nine, ten cameras. Well, today you might have one camera and they share the information. So I understand that uh, journalists are spread awful thin. But when, when we have uh, stories that, you know, let's face it, we all pay more for our insurance because of fraud. And when we have investigations where we found um, you know, fraud, whether it's a, a physician uh, who's working with people who are staging accidents, or uh, it's a prescription drug, uh, you know, mill where, you know, the physician is just pumping out opioids, and we make an arrest for it. We don't necessarily see the type of coverage that I think, as a regulator, that it, it we, is warranted. Um, but there, there are plenty of other things that we do within the department that aren't public when it comes to the solvency uh, of insurance companies. Uh, we do examinations uh, regularly. And uh, if there, there are troubled companies, then we'll, we'll talk about it and we'll warn consumers. But if they're run-of-the-mill um, companies that are in good shape, uh, that's, that's not public. So we really could use some help promoting what we do, who you should talk to, and you, where do you turn if you feel as if you have been... Um, if your insurance, your insurer has not fulfilled their obligations. And you're on mute. Your, your message to journalists is uh, if, if you're trying to get a sort of news you can use uh, out to consumers, if they feel like they've been taken advantage of by their insurance company, uh, probably regardless of the state, the insurance, uh, the insurance commissioner's office is likely a resource uh, their readers can turn to. Sure. I mean, we've, uh, we've helped people. I've helped a person as far away as uh, Washington State who was involved in an auto accident. And they, it was a serious accident. So we, instead of uh, an ambulance, he was flown uh, from the crash site to the hospital. So it was an air ambulance bill, which was around $65,000. And so he was a retired police officer, but he moved to Washington and uh, he called me. And um, we spoke for a few moments. Um, we were able to reach out to our friends in Washington. And uh, essentially, we had the insurer cover the cost, which was what they agreed upon was about one tenth of what our person was, was billed. So um, yeah, we can, we can help. Uh, and even if it's not within our jurisdiction, we don't regulate Medicare and Medicaid. So, um, or ERISA plans, state uh, self-funded plans. But uh, if a person has a problem with a Medicare Advantage plan, or if they have a problem with, uh, you know, any government issued uh, insurance, we can call and speak to someone on the phone who's in charge. Whereas uh, John Citizen can call and have to press one for uh, one prompt, press two for another prompt, uh, speak to a machine and, perhaps never get a call back. We get a resolution. It's not necessarily exactly what people want 100% of the time, because believe it or not, Ryan, sometimes people don't tell you the truth, right? But when it comes to insurance companies and, and, and Title 18, which is our, our criminal code or our um, code for insurance here in Delaware, if they're not in compliance. Um, and the other thing is, 
the last thing they want is a phone call from our office. So if they're not in compliance uh, and we do um, interrogatories, so we'll send them information asking questions about how they handle certain cases and they're smart and they'll cherry pick certain cases and they'll say, oh no, you know, we're, not, we're not doing that, but we already have the complaints. So once we get involved and we do a market conduct exam, they know two things are gonna happen. We're gonna find something and, and there's gonna be fines uh, or penalties associated with it. So um, please use uh, the, your DOI and your per prospective state as a resource because the industry has all of the money. They have all of the lawyers, they have all of the uh, knowledge and experience with dealing with people. And you know, most folks uh, don't deal with insurance enough. Most folks don't know what's in their policy and they don't know who uh, can advocate and stand up for them. And that's exactly what we do each and every day. Tell me a little bit about your, uh, your work with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, because I, you know, I, I just think it's so fascinating that, uh, that you and your counterparts uh, across the country are, are regularly in touch uh, with each other. Uh, and, and I suppose that's important, especially, uh, you know, in, in, in cases of fraud that can uh, cross state lines. But, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that work. Well, it's, it's, Ryan, you're right. It's very important. I mean, some of our, uh, my best ideas, <laughs> I stole from other states. You know, the 1332 waiver, the uh, Cybersecurity Model Act, the PBM legislation. Um, there's a, a number of bills that we have passed over the years that we learn from uh, from other states that were working on on things, and what's funny is now uh, other states are coming to Delaware to find out how we were able to get so many of these model uh, acts or legislations passed here in Delaware. And we're fortunate that um, whether it's uh, well, we just have a good a good relationship with our General Assembly, and so when we bring pro consumer bills to them. Um, like, for example, we're doing a gender and insurance bill right now for private auto insurance. So uh, women in Delaware pay up to 20% more for uh, private auto insurance than men. And so it's a, a rating factor that we believe is unfairly discriminatory. Uh, so we are in the middle of, we just got that passed through the Senate uh, a few weeks ago, and it's in the House now, and we're hoping to get this bill passed because you know, I believe it's unfairly discriminatory. Uh, things like uh, credit score and age discrimination, uh, marital status, education, employment, um, things like that. Uh, or when I mentioned credit score earlier, when you, when you don't have credit, you know, maybe you're, you're young, you don't, haven't had a credit card yet or a car payment. All these factors should not be used to determine what someone pays for, in this example, uh, auto insurance. So we're, we're, we're working with our friends across the country to come up with these model laws that protect consumers. Now, with respect to my role in the NAIC, <laughs> I never thought I'd wear so many hats. I'm the, the vice chair of the D committee, which is the market conduct committee. I uh, am the chair of the anti-fraud uh, task force. I'm the chair of the improper marketing of health insurance plans. Um, the secretary treasurer for the Northeast zone. So what does that mean? <laughs> that means I spend a lot of time with my colleagues across the country um, and sharing uh, information, especially when it comes to fraud uh, cases, because these fraudsters, you mentioned earlier a little about the junk plans um, and some of the um, health sharing ministries, they don't understand state lines, right? Um, we have, we, we're involved right now in investigations in Florida and Texas and Pennsylvania, where people have been uh, defrauded through insurance companies that are offering uh, skinny plans or short term duration plans. And so they're taking in premiums and not paying anything out. Uh, so it leaves the consumer on the hook if they have to have a procedure uh, or uh, you know, something of that nature and then it affects their credit and they're on the hook for that large bill. Um, I've got a question that came in from Brianna who wants to know, what suggestions do you have for reporters who are just wading into the space I want to learn more about how to cover it, how to cover insurance, how to connect uh, with their state insurance commissioner. Um, what, do you, what are your tips for someone just, just getting into this beat? Well, I think it's, um, it's an untapped resource because there's so many things that are happening in, in your home, in your neighbor's home. Uh, you know, when we have uh, a year ago, we had tornadoes in Delaware and uh, homes, communities were leveled. 
and um, insurance companies were dragging their feet. They didn't have enough adjusters. So we passed a bill for emergency adjusters and appraisers. Um, but people don't understand um, what we can do and, and how we can, can actually help. And this is a great time for evergreen stories, right? So uh, something that you know could be um, preparing for the storms or tropical storms uh, starting June 1st when it's tropical storm season, right? What can you do to prepare for that? Who should purchase flood insurance? If, if you live in an area that can rain, you live in an area that can flood. And most people don't think about it. And they think that if, you know, if there's a, a flood in their home, uh, the sewer backs up, that they're covered. They are not. It's actually not in your homeowner's policy. And a lot of people don't necessarily know that. So there's there's things that you can do throughout the year, whether it's uh, you know safety for the holidays or preparing for uh, weather or um, you know once a year we always tell people to shop around. You know you've seen those commercials about um, you know private auto insurance and I'm not endorsing any any company but you know 15 minutes could save 50 percent or more. That's absolutely true. But people don't often shop around their insurance because they're comfortable with their agent. You know, they haven't had any issues in the past, but uh, insurance companies will raise your rates a little bit every, every year. And uh, if you shop around, if you remember anything we talk about today, if you shop around, you can save significant dollars. That's great, thank you. Um, Lucy uh, on our team, who you know, has a, a, a question for you. Sure. Thanks, Ryan. Um, well, you kind of stole my question. I was gonna ask about any. <laughs> But I'll I'll shift gears. Um, Commissioner Navarro, you talked a little bit about um, you know some of the success stories that you've had when consumers right. But what that's when consumers know to call you. Yeah. Um, what do you wish more folks in Delaware knew either before they buy a plan? And I'm thinking about health insurance, but really this is probably broader. You know, either before they buy a plan or once they have to use their plan and they're hitting those kinds of roadblocks. Like, which what do you wish more people knew? I wish people knew what was in their policy. Um, you know, a lot of times people will purchase a plan um, and it doesn't really matter the line, but they, they want it to be affordable, right? And because in some cases, people in Delaware who are on fixed incomes have to determine whether they're gonna pay for their prescription drugs or groceries, right? So people want to, uh, you know, when it comes to private auto, they, they wanna to have to drive, right? They have to go to work and so they wanna, pay the least amount of money for the, a policy. And unfortunately, they don't necessarily read the, the, the fine print and understand what's, what's in their policy. That's one of the things we're working on is uh, plain language so that you don't need to hire uh, an attorney to, to tell you what's in your policy. But that is one of the, our, our biggest problems is that people have insurance and um, they've never had to use it. And then you had this anomaly, uh, you know, tornadoes in Delaware, which almost never happens and I'm knocking on wood. Uh, and I hope I'm not jinxing us, but uh, when that did happen, people didn't know what to do. And you know, the damage from the uh, from the storm, where they didn't take efforts to to mitigate the loss or the additional damage, uh, wasn't necessarily covered. So you know, an, an educated consumer is a, a wise consumer, and one who, um, if you know what's in your policy, you, you'll understand that what you should and shouldn't have with respect to limits and, and coverage. Um, we have a question from Brittany. So if Brittany can unmute herself and ask her question. Yeah, earlier in the workshop, you know, it was mentioned that once this public health emergency ends, a lot of people may no longer be eligible for Medicaid. Uh, which obviously means they're gonna be shopping for private insurance. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, you know, when that happens, it's just going to be ripe for more junk, junk insurance plans yep. and other fraud issues. So I guess like just, you know, in your role, when you think of that, like how concerned are you about a possible increase of fraud? And like, you know, are there ways to kind of be proactive and prevent it before that time comes? So we know fraud always follows the catastrophe, right? So whether it was uh, Hurricane Katrina, which the, the fraud cases started even before the storm hit, uh, or um, COVID-19. So uh, we haven't seen uh, the same scale of fraud uh, with respect to COVID-19 that we saw or we were anticipating. But once the, the emergency is lifted, 
Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, these, uh, these fraudsters will come in. Um, even now, even today, if you type in healthcare.gov, it'll take you to the, the, the proper website. If you type in healthcare.net or healthcare.com, it takes you right to uh, scammers. You know, uh, it, in most cases, just people who are just trying to sell you a plan, they're taking your premiums, but then when it's time to, to pay out a claim, they, they simply don't. So in Delaware, um, we have uh, received funding for navigators that help out during open enrollment. Um, we have still had those contacts with folks who work like at Westside Health, for example, or Lared in the lower part of Delaware, where people are trained uh, navigators who, who can help. If you're um, <clears throat> nearing that golden age of 65, we have people here that can help you sign up for, for Medicare. Uh, if, um, you know, if you have an agent or a broker or producer who you're comfortable with uh, and you, who you trust, um, you know, that because a lot of times people have a lot of questions. Um, I would recommend that as well. But if you if you get a, a, a proposal uh, that is too good to be true, it always is. So it doesn't it doesn't hurt to reach out to your local DOI, your Department of Insurance, and ask them, hey, have you heard of uh, XYZ insurance? You know, have they had any complaints against them? Are they a reputable company? And, and um, we, can, we can help with not necessarily determining which company to go with, but we can help with, uh, with explaining to you and researching companies and, and challenges they may have had in the past. Uh, and Brittany, that's a great question. And I should mention um, tomorrow during the Medicaid panel, um, Megan Messerly of Politico is going to talk about uh, the exact uh, issue you described, what happens when the public health emergency ends and, and what that means in particular for folks who get their coverage through Medicaid. Um, so really excellent question. Um, Ernie uh, had a question. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the video on Ernie. Um, I don't know how to put the video on Ernie, but Ernie, what's your question? Hi, Commissioner. Um, Ernie Davis. My question is, what do you see as far as the regulatory trends among your uh, fellow regulators uh, kind of going on? And I'm thinking a little bit about maybe telehealth issues, um, but any other issues that, that uh, you know, you've, you've talked to your fellow commissioners and superintendents about, especially in regards to health insurance regulation? Well, um, we, we, again, we, we talk about a, a lot of things um, with respect to how we can uh, protect consumers. One of uh, one of the things that we had to do in Delaware was change our code when it comes to telehealth. Uh, during the first few months of, of the pandemic, no one was going to their physicians for preventative care or checkups. They were pushing off uh, procedures that they, that they could do. Um, and so as a consequence, people were getting sicker. Uh, primary care docs weren't able to keep the lights on in some cases. So we were we recognized that very early on and uh, we changed our, um, our telehealth statute or let me rephrase that. The governor's uh, uh, emergency orders allowed us to, you see prior to COVID uh, for telehealth, you had to have uh, audio and visual and, and you know, to, in order to do a telehealth uh, visit. And not everyone has computers, not everyone has uh, access to um, um, 5G or 4G uh, uh, wireless, right? So um, we were able to change the Title um, 24, which is professional code, to allow for um, these types of uh, telehealth visits with just audio, with just, with just a phone call. And um, it really did help sustain primary care docs. But what, the, what came out of this was the ability to do not just uh, telehealth and wellness visits, we could actually do physical therapy. We could do mental health treatment, uh, substance abuse, uh, you know, uh, treatment or at least uh, consultation uh, right over the phone. And so it really did help a, a lot of folks who were home because they had to watch their children, right? Or they, because um, their schools were closed or that they didn't have a primary care doc or uh, they lived in a rural area where there wasn't one available. So, I mean, it had tremendous uh, upside uh, with respect to that. Now, um, you'll hear some regulators talk about telefraud, meaning that, uh, you know, people are being uh, e either, either 
doctors are, are saying that they're treating people for, for example, uh, mental health treatment, when in fact uh, they may, but then they, they're saying they're treating the whole family. So they're, they're billing uh, for four or five people instead of just the, the single person. Um, so those are, there, there are some issues with respect to, to, to telehealth. I don't like to call it telefraud because I, I think it's, uh, at least here in Delaware, it's not happening in the same level as some other states. But uh, we speak a lot about, um, it's not necessarily health insurance, but it will have an impact. And that's long-term care insurance. And you know we could talk about that for days and I don't want to put you to sleep, but I, I'll just say that long-term care insurance will have an impact on health insurers if long-term care uh, companies go insolvent uh, because uh, they're protected through the Guarantee Association, which is paid into by life and health insurance uh, companies. So uh, you know, there's a number of things that, whether it's race and insurance that we're, we're dealing with now, uh, where we have a number of work streams that are looking at uh, whether uh, people are fraud investigations are, are impacted by, by um, or not impacted in a way that's fair for uh, a protected class. Uh, so there's there's lots of things that that we're we're looking at now. Whether it's their leadership of the NAIC or the leadership of uh, the the different agencies and departments across the country uh, to to look at uh, where we are with respect to women and minorities. Uh, in leadership. And so there's uh, about five different work streams that are looking at different uh, uh, components of, of this with respect to race and insurance. Hey, Commissioner Navarro, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, I, know, I know journalists are always interested in data. They're always interested in public records. What sort of data and records, public data and records, uh, are, are maintained by a commissioner's office uh, that may be of interest uh, to a reporter who's you know looking at, at covering these topics. And one of the speakers um, earlier this morning talked about um, some resources she was able to get by making requests to um, an AG's office. But I imagine there's things like that that are, are housed within an insurance commissioner's office as well. Yeah. So our, we uh, our, we receive FOIAs pretty regularly, um, and which we have to, they go through our attorney general's office. But, you know, uh, one of the steps to, it makes it a little bit easier for journalists and, and the, the public as a whole is our website. You know, so we have on that uh, information about the examinations, we have on that information about uh, uh, findings, fines, um, things, things of that nature. So there's a, there's a wealth of information, probably too much on our website. And I say that because uh, it's, it can be a little bit confusing, but there's there's information out there that, um, you know, is, is we want the public to know about, whether it's um, uh, press releases with respect to um, um, fraud investigations where people have been arrested and prosecuted. Um, you don't see a whole lot of those here in Delaware because let's face it, um, it's considered a, um, it's a felony, right? I mean, insurance fraud is a felony, but our prosecutors are you know, prosecuting murderers and, and rapists and, and people who commit serious assaults and kidnappings and things like that. So I'm not suggesting it's not important to our prosecutors, but we do more consent decrees than uh, actual arrests for insurance fraud. And you know, unfortunately, um, you know, desperate people do desperate things in desperate times. So good people who would never think of committing a a robbery, right, or or a felony assault on someone, but they don't think about insurance fraud and the fact that insurance fraud is a felony. And so, um, you know, we've seen people who have have purchased insurance um, after an accident, right? So they maybe they 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 have to drive because they have to work, but they didn't have insurance, and then they have an accident, and then they they purchase insurance the next day and report an accident. Well, that's pretty easy to determine. Uh, so that, 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 those types of cases where we actually make arrests, that's on our website. Uh, and, and again, uh, we, we want the public to know what's going on and what's happening within our uh, agencies, and whether it's the fraud commercials that we do or the promotions of the ACA um, that we, we, we do that I don't necessarily have to, but we have funding to, to do that to help promote it because it touches so many lives and helps so many people. 
Um, it may be kind of a funny question, and and perhaps I should be uh, uh, careful about asking a public official this, but but I'd be curious to know, uh, you know, especially as you look at you know your your colleagues across the fifty states, um, what what can't you do, you know, that you wish you could do, as as you see kind of all all the different flavors of uh, of fraud and misleading marketing. I mean, you know, uh, in, insurance can, can be a, a, a rough place. You know, tell us about maybe some of the limitations of your office um, that, you know, that perhaps the best, uh, you know, the best tool at your disposal, the best disinfectant is the publicity, perhaps, that journalists are able to bring to some of these issues. So there's 56 of us. So there's the 50 states and the six territories. So there's 56 commissioners. And, you know, trying to get us all to agree to agree on model legislation, I, I wish that... Um, you know, I, I wish that we were all, all of us, not, you know, not the other 55 of us. I mean, all of us were a little bit more open-minded when it comes to, um, you know, policies that help consumers. Politics get involved in, in our, our everyday lives. So in some states, um, you know, that are blue may have more progressive plans, where in some states that are red, it just might be different. Um, so that's, that's, one of the, the, the biggest challenges that we have is just to, to, to get us to agree on some of the things that we're doing. But we're all state-based regulators, meaning that we all um, have our own title, our own code that we have to comply with. And um, so that we're all individual and unique, although some of our, our um, regardless of your political status, uh, our, our, our title and our laws are the same. You know, they're, they're pro-consumers protect people. But then there's others that um, that just aren't for a variety of reasons. So I mean, I, I it's it's a blessing to be a state-based regulator because I can I I can oversee the industry in a way that uh, collectively I and the department think is the, the best uh, protections for Delaware. But that's a great question, Ryan. And that is that when you have fraud cases that are all over the country, but the the, because uh, the company is uh, licensed um, in Delaware or incorporated in Delaware, uh, it makes it difficult sometimes to to put an end to these practices because they'll close in one state and then pop up in another state under another name and do the exact same thing, exact same corporate governance, the exact same folks who are involved. So I mean, if if I if I had my way. I wish that there was a way to, we work with the FBI and the Department of Labor and other federal agencies, uh, CMS, SOSIO, but it's really tough to, um, to, to put together a you know, multi-state investigation that's criminal in nature. It's easy to do a multi-state investigation for market conduct, but um, and in most cases, the market conduct exams will result in the companies fixing the problem. But when it's a criminal investigation, um, you know they're just they'll, they'll shut they'll close up shop in one state and just open up in another state, and it's it really is they're taking in millions and millions and millions of dollars, but not paying out any claims. So I wish that I had the ability to investigate fraud in every state. We, I think I think consumers wish you could too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, t tell us a little bit about, you know, I, I know um, uh, kind of m issues around marketing are um, a big, a big passion of yours. Um, and I know, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, you know, these, these junk insurance plans um, have kind of been at, at, you know, kind of real emerging issue uh, in this space. Um, you know, if if you could share anything with with journalists about that topic, you know, what what do, what do you want what do you want them to know? Because I, you know, I've got the sense that um, this may be a, something that's kind of rampant in uh, in many communities, but is flying under the radar. Well, it's under the radar, but it's also right under your nose. I mean, you see the commercials with uh, J.J. Walker. Uh, William Shatner, uh, Joe Namath. I, I, I've even heard now they have, um, uh, what's the horse's name uh, from way back in the talking horse? Uh, oh, Mr. Ed. Ed. Mr. Ed, right? Who, that our elderly population, they associate with that. I mean, they, that was something they watched when, when they were younger. The, um, the, we had a lady, here's, uh, here's one of my guests here, I apologize, but she comes and visits at all my, my, all my meetings. We had a lady the other day say, I want that Joe Namath plan. Right, so you saw the commercial 
on, uh, on TV that mentions uh, the Medicare Advantage plans. Well, that's the Philadelphia market, right? So we're in the Philadelphia market. We don't even sell that plan in Delaware. So, um, you know, what they don't tell you, you know, you see, they'll say things like, well, we can get more money in your social security check, or, um, you know, we, you get free rides to the doctor. And they, they offer all these things. And you know what? If you tell us your zip code, you might get more money in your social security check. What they don't tell you is that in most cases, these, uh, there's, no, there's no network for, for these types of plans. They are less in some cases. That's the only way you get more money in your, in your social security check is if the plan you purchase from them is cheaper than what you're already paying for, which very well may be the case, but there's nothing there to support it. So um, we recently wrote a letter to Congress, we meaning the NAIC and uh, folks involved in anti-fraud and senior, the senior task force, working force, uh, task force, um, to ask uh, to have the jurisdiction back for these Medicare Advantage plans. You see back in 2003 or four, um, the, the regulation was, was taken away from state-based regulators and given to, to uh, CMS. And they, you know, do a great job, but they don't have the staffing and the, the bandwidth to investigate these companies the way that they should be. And um, that is, uh, for me, um, they don't tell you the rest of the story, meaning that these commercials that you see, and it's very misleading. And I would, if, if I had the uh, regulatory authority, I would shut them down in, in the state of Delaware. Uh, because uh, what they're selling people is not what they're promising. Um, and if you're if you're listening to this and you're you're uh, curious to know more, um, at 3:40 we have a panel on Medicare uh, and the scams that Commissioner uh, Navarro uh, is discussing is definitely going to be a, a, a topic. And I know one of the one of the panelists there as well is. Uh, furious about those uh, Joe Namath commercials. So um, we'll, we'll dive into that uh, a little bit more. Um, kind of la la last question for you, um, and, and we've asked some other panelists about this, but uh, you know, er earlier this year, a um, federal law banning surprise medical bills took effect. Um, you know, obviously that's been a big issue facing consumers for a, for a long time. Um, what are you seeing in your state uh, and what are you seeing nationally? Are there are there still um, holes that need to be plugged in those protections? Absolutely. Um, you see the, I mentioned the air ambulance billing uh, earlier. Um, that doesn't fall under state-based regulators. That falls under the FAA. So we, we, we have no ability to, um, to, to regulate these types of uh, billing practices. I shouldn't say we have no ability. We, we can call and we do call and we have been successful in working uh, with lowering the, the cost for that. But in, in Delaware, uh, we have uh, the ability uh, for arbitration for, um, for both uh, citizens and, and for physicians. And um, we've been pretty successful uh, in helping people with uh, these types of uh, surprise bills. So we, we already have legislation in place that protected consumers and it gives them the opportunity uh, for arbitration. So yes, it, it, it is a big deal. Um, commissioners across the country are concerned with uh, surprise billing. We are as well, but it's not as, uh, uh, not as prevalent in Delaware as it is in other parts of, of the country. Um, you know, what's, what's happening, and I'll go back to the air ambulance bill, um, you know, we're seeing in some cases, a hundred thousand dollar bill, and all they did was fly them from one hospital to a, another hospital that specializes in the care the person needs. The person at the time is, you know, incapable of making that decision, and so uh, when they when they um, come out of the hospital and say, for example, they have that bill, but there's also a, um, a, a anesthesiologist who wasn't in network, uh, so they, they'll they'll get a bill uh, from them as well. Um, the, the truth is we've been really successful in, in uh, whether it's in arbitration or whether it's just a phone call with uh, helping people, consumers, because like I mentioned earlier, Ryan, the last thing that, that insurance uh, companies want is a phone call from our office and specifically a phone call from me uh, because uh, look, I mean, 
in law enforcement, um, you know, it's, there's right and wrong, right? There's the law and, and then uh, that you either follow it or there's consequences for not following. Well, it's the same premise uh, with respect to insurance. And, um, and, you know, the industry knows that. And, and I think they respect where we stand because there's, um, there's no gray area, gray area. I mean, it's, 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 it's right and wrong. And, um, you know, we try to, although we always try to do the greatest good for the greatest amount of people, um, the industry understands where we stand. And I think that's, uh, that it's important and it helps consumers um, because they're still going to try their tricks, but they know if they, if they get caught and if they know that, um, you know, we get wind of it, there'll be consequences. Mr. Navarro, thank you so much for your time today. This was a lot of fun. I, I learned a lot. I'm sure the journalists in the audience learned a lot. Um, I've got a feeling that whether uh, a reporter lives in Delaware or not, you're happy to have them reach out to, uh, to your office as they cover these issues. Yeah, it's been my pleasure, Ryan. Thank you so very much. Stay safe, everyone.